glad you're here. If you uh, have your Bible, turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. If you're uh, watching online, we're glad that you're hanging out with us. For the last uh, several weeks, we've been talking about these, uh, these four chairs. And if you were here for week one of that series, we, talked, we asked a question. And today I want to ask a similar question, and it's this. Uh, how, do, how do you define success? Or maybe another way to ask it is, when you look at somebody else, how do you determine whether or not they're successful? Now, in certain areas, it's uh, fairly easy to tell who's successful and who's not. So let me give you an example. Next weekend, college football kicks off, you know, for real. And I've got a picture here I want to show you of Coach Saban, Alabama. Uh, in, In sports, if you're a coach, success is determined by wins and losses. If you win more games than you lose, you're considered to be successful. So you look at somebody like Saban, uh, 222 wins against 62 losses and six national championships. Obvious, he's been very successful. Think about the world of entertainment. I read this week where the actress Scarlett Johansson is this year's highest paid actress. Uh, She made $40 million for her part in The Avengers. So, I mean, at this point in her career, every movie she's in is a success. So you could say, you know, if you're looking at movies and uh, how much money you make, she's been very successful. In the business world, you have people like Warren Buffett. He's an investor. I looked it up this week as of Friday, two days ago. His net worth was over $85 billion. Can you imagine what it would be like to have that much money? So if you're in business and the goal is to make money, then certainly Warren Buffett has been a a huge success. You think about the military. Success is determined by how many battles you win. So you think about George Patton, uh, World War II general, very colorful uh, character. Uh, But if you go back and study, one of our best generals. So obviously a very successful person. And the point is that in a lot of areas, it's, it's fairly easy to tell who's successful. And these people are examples of people that we look to. They write books about them. They make documentaries about them. I mean, if you're looking at the measuring sticks that, that most of us use to determine success, these people would be examples of it. Now, now keep that in mind, and I want, you to, I want to ask you another question. Uh, how do you determine whether or not you're successful in a, when, you, when it comes to your spiritual life? How do you know if you're a success in your spiritual life? That question is much harder to answer, and for some reason, when it comes to your spiritual life, the answers start to get a little bit fuzzy. It's not like you can look at your win-loss record. It's not like your, your job title or your bank account will tell you anything. So we start to come up with different ways of measuring ourselves. So we ask questions like, uh, do I sin less than I used to? And the answer is hopefully. Uh, am I more involved in church than I used to be? Do I give more than I used to? Am I serving more than I used to? So we come up with all these different ways uh, of determining whether or not we're being successful as followers of Jesus. And all those things are important, but, but today what I want to talk about, which is a few minutes, is an, a different measuring stick to determine whether or not you're really being successful. A different way of thinking when it comes to your your spiritual life. So if you have your Bible open to 1 Peter 5, we're going to look at something that, that Peter wrote. But before we get there, we've been in this series. We've been talking about these, these four chairs for four weeks now. The first chair is the one we labeled seek. These are people who are trying to figure this out. You know, they got some questions. Uh, they've got some things. They're trying to decide whether or not they believe any of this stuff, how they fit into this stuff. Chair number two is the chair we labeled grow. These are people who've made some sort of a spiritual decision, and now they're trying to grow into it. They're trying to learn some things. Uh, they're trying to, to understand some things, so they're, they're growing in their faith. Last week, we talked about chair three. That's the chair we labeled serve. The idea is that as you grow, uh, you grow to a point where you're able to help other people experience what you've already experienced. So if you missed any of those, you can check them out on our website or on our new uh, uh, YouTube channel. The link is, is in your bulletin there. But today we want to talk about chair number four, which is lead. And to be honest with you, chair number four is a chair that, that very few people actually reach. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And we'll, we'll talk about that some next week. But just so you understand, even though it's a chair that, that very few people actually reach, it's a chair that, that all of us are called to. The idea is that as you grow, as you serve, eventually you'll become a leader of people. But there's a lot of things that change when you get to this fourth chair. And one of the things that changes is how you measure success. All of a sudden, 
It has nothing to do with how many Bible studies you go to, how much money you give, how many ministry teams you serve on or mission trips or any of those things that we tend to look at. When you get to chair number four, the goal changes. And to put it in just, just one word, if you're following along, the goal of, of chair four is multiplication. That becomes your goal. The goal of a person who's sitting in chair number four is to reproduce themselves in the lives of other people. Another way to say it is this. The, the goal of a person who reaches this level uh, is, to, is to make disciples who will then go out and make more disciples. The goal of chair four is for the leader to multiply their influence by helping to create more leaders. Just so you don't think I'm making this up, uh, this is the way Jesus operated. You see this kind of uh, multiplication thinking modeled in the life of Jesus. If you've been with us through this series, you know, uh, you see this progression. So John chapter one, Jesus is starting his ministry and he goes out and there are these guys there and he, he, he issues this invitation. He says, come, come and you will see. That's his invitation. Just come hang out with me. You know, just come follow me around. You'll see some things, and, and hopefully in the process of all that, you'll start to get some of your questions answered. You'll start to figure out where you fit in all this. And then about a year later, he goes to the same group of people, and he issues a, a different invitation. This time, he's, he's inviting them to go from just watching him to actually joining him. It's just this transition from just watching him do ministry to, to them themselves actually becoming engaged in this. Matthew 4, here's the, the second invitation. He says, come and, and follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. There's something really interesting that happens after this moment. If you keep reading in the life of Jesus, what you find is that from this moment forward, from, from that call in Matthew 4 on to the end of his life, he spends the, the vast majority of his time with the 12 disciples. He spends the vast majority of his time with this, this small group of people. Dan Spader did a study in the New Testament. Here's what he found. From this moment on, Jesus spends 73% of his time alone with the 12 disciples and only 27% of his time with crowds of people. 46 instances where Jesus is with his small group, and there's only uh, 17 events where he's with some large group of people, three to one ratio. And I don't know about you, but I think that's interesting when you consider how most of us think about church, how most of us uh, view church, how most of us participate in church. The truth is most churches, and we probably fall into this too, are obsessed with addition. You know what I mean? It's all about trying to win one more person. But here's the idea that Jesus was focused on. What if, what if instead of worrying about addition, instead we focused on multiplication? Let me give you an example of what this could look like. Currently, as a church, we have five people who work on our staff. Me, uh, David, Jamie, Cody, and Anita. I want you to imagine that for the next year, all five of us made it our mission to win uh, one person per week to Jesus. All five of us are going to win one person per week and help them connect with Jesus. And that would be awesome because in the course of a year, that would be uh, 260 people who came to Christ, which would be great. Now, if we did that every week for five years, every week for five years, that would be 1,300 people. Take that on out to 10 years it's uh, 2,600 people. So that's an example of addition thinking. Let's all just, every week, we're going to win one person to Christ. We're going to keep doing that forever, and we're just going to keep adding people to the kingdom. Now, let's come at it from a different angle. On an average Sunday now, uh, we run a little better than 300 people. So let's say that one-third of our church, just, just one out of every three people, decided they were going to make it their mission not to win a person every week, but just to win one person per year to Jesus. Not, not every week, not every month, just 100 people say, we're going to make it our goal to win 100, uh, one person to Jesus this year. Now, if 100 people did that in year two, you'd get to 200 people. It'd be 100 more additions. And let's just say that of those 100 people you won, you train them to do the same thing. Hey, your job, we're going to win you to Christ, and now your job is to go and win one more to Christ, and we're just going to keep multiplying like that. That means in year two, you'd have the original 100 plus the 100 you won. They would win a couple hundred people, and by year five, you'd have 1,600 people all won to Jesus. By year six, you'd have 3,200. By 10 years in, you'd have over 100,000. If everybody just won one person per year, just one, not per week, 
but just one. That's the difference. That's an example of multiplying your influence. You're not doing everything, but you're training people to do it with you. Jesus understood that. That's why over a long period of time, Jesus said multiplication is more important than addition. That's why he spent the the vast majority of his time training this this small group of 12 guys who would, would carry his movement forward. So the way that Jesus measured success from this moment forward was not by counting attendance numbers. He didn't look up and say, oh man, we had 5,000 people at the fish fry today. He, he measured success by how many people those 12 reproduced themselves in going forward. It's a different, different measuring stick. One of the guys who experienced this training was Peter. We've looked at him at different times. You remember, uh, as he starts out, he's a disciple of John the Baptist. Jesus walks by one day and John says, behold, the, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And John the, uh, Peter and his brother Andrew leave John the Baptist. They begin to follow Jesus. For the next year, they just sort of follow him around. A year later, they're out there in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus gets in the boat with them, says, let's go out to the deep water. If you remember the story, they catch uh, so many fish that they don't know what to do with them. And from that moment forward, Peter leaves his old life behind, and he spends the rest of his life doing what Jesus called him to do, which was fish for people. A couple years into the future, after the resurrection, it's Peter who becomes a a key leader in the church. He's the guy that preaches the the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. And then from that moment forward, he spends the rest of his life fishing for people. Fast forward to the year 64 AD. It's now been about 30 years since Jesus has returned to his father. And Peter finds himself living in Rome which was kind of ground zero for the opposition. Every day that Peter was there, uh, the heat got turned up, the persecution intensified, and in fact, just within just two years, uh, Peter will be crucified himself by the Roman emperor, a crazed Roman emperor named Nero. But by this point, Peter has spent three decades planting churches, helping churches, doing everything he can to spread the message. But now he, he knows that the, the end is drawing near. He can feel the persecution intensifying. He knows he's on his way out. So he takes some time to, to write down some things that he wants to pass on. And one of the things he writes is this letter that we know is, is First Peter. And what he does when you get to chapter 5 is Peter paints us a picture of what a person sitting in chair number 4 is supposed to look like. He said, here's, here's what you need to know about leadership. Here's what you need to know about your priorities as a spiritual leader. And there's one sort of key thing, key idea. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you. Here it is. Peter says over and over again, leading starts with following. Leading starts with, with following. And most of the time in our culture, we think about leadership. We think of somebody, you know, that, you know, sits in the corner office and makes decisions and moves the pieces around and is trying to achieve the mission. They do whatever it takes to achieve their goals. But when it comes to, to spiritual leadership, Peter says it doesn't work that way. Instead, spiritual leadership starts with following Jesus. Look what he says in verse 1 of 1 Peter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will share in the glory to be revealed. First thing I want you to notice there is that he he calls himself an elder. Uh, In the New Testament church, elders are are spiritually mature men who are called to to lead the church and oversee the church, make sure the church is doing what it's been called to do. And Peter was one of those guys. So, So you read this, and his job is to make sure that the leaders in the church are doing their job. And, and if you're not careful, you read this, and I know what you think. You think, okay, that's cool, but, but I'm off the hook for this because I'm not an elder, or I'm not a teacher, or I don't lead a ministry team. And you think, well, this is for somebody else, but I'm just going to tell you, you, you may not realize you're a leader, But if you have any influence over anybody else on this planet, then you're a leader. If you're a parent, you're a leader. If you're a grandparent, you're a leader. If you work in an environment where there are other people, you're a leader. Uh, If you have conversations with people, you're a leader. If you have friends that you hang out with, uh, you're a leader. So so nobody's off the hook with this. Here's the other thing I want you to notice. Peter, Peter defines himself in terms of his relationship with Jesus. His whole life has been defined by his relationship to Jesus. He calls himself a witness of Christ's sufferings. A couple chapters earlier, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he says it like this. He says, to this 
you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Peter's whole life has been about following in Jesus' steps. Same thing we're called to do. Jesus is the example. Our job is simply to follow, not to make it up as we go, just simply to follow what he's told us to do. But here's the thing you have to remember. In order to do that, when you get to chair four, it, it's really a continuation of the other chairs. You continue seeking, you continue to grow, you continue to serve, and hopefully at some point you transition and you become, you become a leader. But it all depends on how close you're following. As you keep reading, Peter highlights three things you have to do if you want to be this type of leader, a leader that, that multiplies their influence. Here, here's the first one. You invest in people. Verse 2 of 1 Peter 5. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Now, the main image that the Bible uses to describe a spiritual leader is is that of a shepherd. Probably doesn't connect with most of us because that's not the world uh, that we live in, but the first step for any shepherd is to identify their flock. And it's not as hard as it sounds. If, if you're here and you think, well, okay, I'm a leader, but who's my flock? It's not as hard as it sounds. If you're a parent, your kids are your flock. If you're a grandparent, your family is your flock. If you're a teacher or a coach, then, then your flock is your class or your team. If you're a business owner, the flock that, that's under your care, the people that, that work with you and work for you. If you lead some kind of group in the church or, or in the community, those people are, are your flock, and it's your responsibility to lead them in the right direction. So how do you do that? Well, one of the main responsibilities of a shepherd is to make sure to feed his flock. Matthew 4, here's what Jesus says. Man shall not live... On bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That means that, that one of the primary jobs of a leader is to make sure the people that are under your care, the people that you have influence over, are, are, are offered a, a steady diet of God's word. So, for example, if you're a parent, one of your primary jobs is to make sure that your kids are fed a steady diet of God's word. Let me ask you, how you doing with that? I mean, I'm not here to beat you up. I know it's hard. I mean, I know you got, you're pulling a thousand different directions. Sometimes it's, it's overwhelming. But, but if, if, if that's your flock, you have to ask yourself, you know, how, how am I doing with that? Do your kids know that worship is a priority? I mean, they know. Do your kids ever see you, like, reading your Bible on your own time? Are your kids involved in some kind of group? where they're being taught the, the Bible. And those are the kinds of things. Over the long haul, those are the kinds of things that tend to have the, the, the long-term impact. Those are the kinds of things that will, will multiply your influence over a long period of time. Here's the second thing Peter mentions. If, if you want to be a leader who multiplies your influence, you're going to have to, to model humility. Look at verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, in our world, a lot of us have bought in this idea that, that a leader is somebody, you know, with a, a big personality and they, they, uh, they got a big ego and they like making decisions and they, they crave the spotlight. I mean, when you think about great leaders, you might think about Steve Jobs or or Jack Welch, or some other business leader. You know, there are people, they walk in the room, you know, every eye turns towards them. Everybody can't wait to hear what they have to say. That's, that's the kind of leadership that a lot of people have aspired to. But then in the early 2000s, there was a, a shift in thinking that began to take place in large part due to the work of a researcher from Stanford. His name is, is Jim Collins. I'm going to show you a picture. Dr. Collins and, and his team researched... Uh, Every Fortune 500 company in the United States, there were 1,400 companies that qualified as, as uh, Fortune 500 companies. And out of, that four, out of those 1,400 companies, they identified 11 that they uh, labeled as level five companies. These are the, kind of the, you know, the best of the best, kind of the elite. 
And they often uh, asked questions of those 11 companies. They, they narrowed their focus to those 11. They tried to dissect what it was that made those 11 companies so good. And what they discovered was that each of those companies was led by what they called a, a level five leader. They then set out to determine what it was that made those leaders so great. And what they discovered went against the grain of what most of us think about when we think about leadership. I want you to listen to what Dr. Collins wrote in his book, Good to Great. Here's what he said. He said, we discovered that level five leaders display a powerful mixture of personal humility and indomitable will. They're incredibly ambitious, but their ambition is first and foremost for the cause and not themselves. In fact, every good to great transition in our research began with a leader who was often self-effacing, quiet, reserved, and even shy. It goes against everything that we think about when we think about leadership. But you go back 2,000 years, same thing that Peter said. Clothe yourselves in humility. Greek, it's written in the present tense, which means this is going to be an ongoing battle. It's going to be something you're always going to have to, to guard against. As a leader, your job is to serve people, not go around demanding that people serve you. In verse 3, if you look at this close, Peter says, hey, if you're a leader, whether you're at home, whether you're in the business community, whether you're at church, whatever it is you're doing, you're to be the example and not the exception. That's your job as a leader. One more thing Peter mentions, and it's this. If you want to be a leader who multiplies your influence, you're going to have to maintain your focus. Check out what he says in verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for, for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. One thing you can count on, it was whenever you get serious about this, whenever you get serious about moving to the next level in your spiritual life, Satan is going to do everything he can to distract you. He's going to do everything he can to derail you. Peter uses the image of a lion that prowls around. I did some reading about lions this week, and you may already know this. Uh, lions, when they hunt, they, they hunt by what's known as, as stealth, which means they like to sneak up on you. They'll follow their prey for hours, sometimes even days, and they, they'll, they'll be behind their prey undetected, and from time to time, you know, they'll, they'll inch a little closer, and they'll inch a little closer, doing their best not to be, not to be detected, and then as soon as that prey uh, gets a little bit relaxed, as soon as they let their guard down, that lion comes out of nowhere and attacks and destroys them. Same way Satan operates. He's always lurking. He's always watching for an opportunity. And he uses a lot of different weapons. Sometimes he uses the weapon of distraction. You get so busy, you're being pulled in so many different directions, he just gets you distracted. Sometimes it's, it's busyness, your, your workload picks up, your kids are busy, you got all kinds, you don't have time to, to catch your breath, and you just, you just lose your focus. Sometimes it's family conflict. Somebody, uh, something goes wrong in your family, it just eats up your mind, you worry about it, and you begin to neglect your, your spiritual life because you're worried about something. For a lot of people in our culture, he uses the distraction of, of comfort. I mean, let's just be honest. Most of us here live really comfortable lives. You know what I mean? You, you go home, and I know you work hard, and then what happens is you go home, you know, you grab some food, you kick back in the recliner, you turn on the big screen, you spend two hours scrolling through Netflix trying to find something to watch, and then you, you find something, and you binge watch it until it's time to go to bed, and you get up the next day, and you do this. And for a lot of people, before they even realize it, that becomes their life. It's work and comfort, work and comfort. And it's like we get lulled to sleep. And what's the answer to all that? Well, Peter says in verse 8, it's just two words. It's, it's be alert. It means to, to stay awake, to stay vigilant, to, to keep your eyes open, to refuse to be so distracted that you lose sight of what's important. It means not to be, not to be lulled to sleep. It means to, to keep your eyes on the goal, which is, is fishing for people, not getting distracted, not getting, not getting sidetracked by a million other things that are swirling around you. 2 Timothy 2, the apostle Paul says this, to his younger associate, he says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier. 
of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier, check this out, gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding. I love that word entangled because that's what happens. Man, you get distracted, you, you lose your focus, and all of a sudden your life is all tangled up in all sorts of other stuff, and you're neglecting the one thing that Jesus said matters most. And part of the deal, if you want to make a long-term impact, you're going to have to train yourself to stay focused. As we close today, I want to show you a picture of two people that if uh, evaluated by the standards of money and fame would probably not be considered all that successful. These are my great-grandparents. Uh, I forgot my memo's name in the first service, but it, it is Della. And my grandpa's name is, is William. And if you ever, there's a commercial that's around now. Have you ever heard that phrase, uh, come at me, bro? You ever heard that? That started with my great-grandpa. Uh, you can tell kind of by his look there, he's ready to take on all comers. Anybody that wants some is welcome to, to give him a try there. Um, To explain the, the backstory here, uh, my great grandpa, growing during his career, was was for the most of it a, a tenant farmer, which means they made very little money. Finances were always a concern, um, not not a big lifestyle at all. Seventy-seven years ago, something happened in the life of my great grandparents that changed the trajectory of their lives. The year was 1941. By 1941, they had already had. Uh, three children, finances were concerned, when my great-grandma gave birth to twins, one boy and one girl. Now, as I said, very little money, challenge just to keep food on the table for the kids you've got, and now you add two to the mix, a very difficult situation. The other thing to, to realize is that at this time, uh, they had no connection to a church, no spiritual life, no interest in a spiritual life. That was just just not on their radar. Sometime in the late 1930s, they moved from the mountains to, to Bourbon County, Kentucky, which is, is Paris, where they farmed a little bitty uh, farm as tenant farmers made very little money. And it was there, though, that they, they came in contact with a neighbor for the first time who, who was a Christian who was involved in his church, and he made it his mission to get my great-grandpa and his family involved in his church. Uh, so every week, he would come over and invite them to church, and they sort of had this, this weird routine they would go through. Every Saturday, the neighbor would come over, he'd, he'd knock on the door and invite him to church. My grandpa would say no, run him off, and that would be the end of it. Next Saturday, to roll around, he'd knock on the door, invite him to church. My grandpa would run him off, and, and that, was, that was how it went on for months like that. Sometime, though, in 1941, about six months after giving birth to those twins, the boy that had been born, the little boy, the twin, uh, got really sick one morning. They took him to the doctor, and by that afternoon, he was dead. And some of you know the pain of that because some of you have experienced that. As I said, though, very little money. Now you have to figure out how to pay for a burial, how to pull together a, a funeral for a six-month-old baby. It was then that a, a preacher entered the story. And I called around this week. My grandma called around. Nobody in the family can remember this guy's name. Now, they can remember kind of what he looks like, but, but nobody can remember his name. But there's this unnamed preacher, and he agrees to do this little graveside service for this six-month-old little boy from a family that he's never met. Now, I thought about that a lot this week, and I thought, you know, I'm sure that guy had other things to do. You know what I mean? I'm sure he had people to see and places to be and meetings to go to and, and sermons to work. I mean, I'm sure all that. I know it's demanding. But, but decades later, my, my grandfather, who was seven years old at the time, said that was his first experience with a preacher. Never been to a church service. Seven years old, it's his first experience. He says, that's when the Lord spoke to him and told him that he was going to be a preacher. Now, I, you know, I don't know how you explain all that, seven years old. I'm just telling you, that's what he said. It was a, a defining moment in his life. So they had this little graveside service. The preacher, you know, uh, says a few words. They pray, and everybody goes home. And for a while, they went right back to the, the old routine. You know what I mean? Right back to the, the normal routine. That generation didn't talk about stuff. You just sort of put your head down and, 
and went on. So every week, every Saturday, the neighbor would come over, hey, uh, you want to go to church? No, get out of here. Okay, you know, good to see you. And that, that was kind of the way it went on. Went like that for, for up to a couple years. The only difference was that this time they began to think about it. And there were some seeds that were planted in a cemetery next to a grave plot that began to grow. In fact, they grew to the point that one Sunday, my great-grandpa and his family just actually got up and decided to go to a church service. The place they went was a little bitty storefront church in Cynthiana, Kentucky that was led by a preacher named Sam Adams. Now, I asked my grandma. She grew up in the same town. I asked her this week. I said, what do you remember about that church? I said, uh, how many people went there? She said, on a normal Sunday, they probably had 15. On a big Sunday, they might have had 25. And then she told me about Brother Adams. She said he was one of these guys. He's kind of a, uh, kind of a fireballer. You know what I mean? Kind of one of them guys that like to yell and stomp around and really let you have it. Uh, I keep thinking I'm going to try that one of these days just to, just to scare everybody, just go crazy. Um, but that's, that's kind of his style. And one random Sunday morning, my great-grandparents and their four kids marched in that little church. And then the strangest thing happened. They went back the next week. And then they just started going. And one by one, they all became a part of that little group. They all became... Christians. A few years later, my grandpa would revisit that call on his life. He became a preacher much, much better than I am and traveled I mean, all over the world, preached to thousands of people. And then fast forward to 1983, and he had a grandson who eventually wound up preaching to you in Monticello, Kentucky in 2018. Now, I thought a lot about that this week, and here's the conclusion I reached. Almost everything good in my life can be traced back to an annoying but persistent neighbor who refused to give up, an unnamed preacher who took 30 minutes out of his schedule to do a funeral for somebody he didn't know, and a storefront preacher who on his best Sundays preached to a crowd of 25 people. Now, if you were going to go back in history to 75 years ago, none of those people would probably be examples of success. I mean, they're not, they're, their names aren't in the paper. Nobody made any movies about them. No money to speak of. Uh, certainly nobody's made any documentaries about them. But here's, here's what I know. Without them, my life looks a lot different. And I bet you've got people like that too. They planted seeds. They watered seeds. And 77 years later, the ripple effects continue. Now, here's the deal. Do you think it's possible that what you're doing right now, or maybe what you're not doing right now, is going to affect people for the next 75 years? You think it's possible that the invitations you extend or the invitations you don't extend, you think it's possible that, that what your kids see you doing on a regular basis is not only going to change their reality, but your grandkids and your great-grandkids and, and, and on down the line? That's why we talk about this stuff. That's why it's so important that you keep, you keep moving in your spiritual life. You don't stay where you are. God is calling all of us to to something much greater. So here's the deal. We're going to have an invitation. If you're here and you say, man, I'm not moving. I'm stuck in chair number one. I need to get chair number two. Then just move. Today's, I mean, today's a great day. We'll, we'll walk you through it. We'll help you do it. If you're in chair two and you need to get chair three, we'll help you. Don't stay where you are because the mission is too important and the consequences go out much further than you can ever imagine. 75, 80 years from now, they are going to be people that you're going to be impacted and you're not even going to know about. But the decisions you make today, Gonna make a big difference. Let's stand.